We're here in Deuteronomy chapter number four and look down at verse five where the Bible reads and it says, Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me that ye should do so in the land whither ye go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them, as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And the title of my sermon comes from verse 8 where it reads, And what nation is there so great that hath statues and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? And the title of my sermon today is The Great Word of God. The great word of God. So in this passage, Moses is t uh, telling the people how God gave him the, the laws and statutes and that other nations are there to look on these laws that God's given the children of Israel. And they're going to see these laws and say, hey, that the children of Israel, they are wise and understanding people. These statues that God's given them are great. Let's go over some of these verses again. Look down at verse six where it says, keep therefore and do them for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear these statues and say, surely this nation is a wise and understanding people. So we see in this part of the passage that people are going to see God's laws, they're going to hear it, and they're going to say that the people who follow God's laws and follow God's commandments are a wise and understanding people. Amen. Not only that, if you look down to verse 7, it says, For what nation is there so great, who hath God so nigh unto them, as the Lord our God in all things, that we call upon him for and what nation is there so great that have statues and judgments so righteous as this law which i set before you this day so the people of the land and other nations are going to say that god's laws are righteous the statutes and judgments that god has are righteous which has been set before him this day so the issue i believe with the bible or with god's law it's not god's law is bad i believe god's law as the bible says is perfect the problem is is that we can't keep all of god's law which is uh the reason why uh, a lot of people like to scoff at the law but i think the law is really important i think god's word puts a lot of emphasis on the law and it's there not that we have to keep it perfectly. It's just there to have different, especially with the moral uh, standards of the law. It's there so we can have a set of guidelines of how to live our lives, an uh, idea or understanding of what's right and what's wrong. Now, look down at Deuteronomy 4, 9. It says, Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thy eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life, but teach thy sons and thy son's sons. So uh, Moses is saying that you shouldn't let the things that you've seen and that the things that obviously you've heard depart from your heart. So God's law shouldn't depart from our heart. It shouldn't de depart from our minds. It shouldn't depart from us. We shouldn't forget about God's law. We should keep God's law close to our hearts. And then not only that, we should teach other people God's law. You know, it says you should teach that you should teach your sons and your son's sons. Now, I believe this is applicable to today. Now, obviously for salvation, we don't have to keep God's law. And I'll have you go ahead and turn to 1 Peter chapter number one. But for salvation, we don't have to keep God's law. It's, but I do believe God this law is applicable from a moral standpoint that there are things that are right and wrong that we should or shouldn't do. And when we do those things, God ends up blessing us and things that we don't do. Obviously, we get punished for those things. Now, I believe that the whole Bible has to harmonize where every the Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God from God and is profitable for doctrine. So every part of the Bible is important. Regardless of, because there are a lot of people who like to scoff at God's law, and the people I think of the most are people who are in like the hyper grace movement, if ever, anyone's heard of that, yeah. where they just disregard God's law. They say everything's just by grace, we're saved by grace, and God's law doesn't matter at this point. You can technically, or you can do whatever you want, and God's not going to really care, which that's not true at all. Yeah. But not only that, these people, they just disregard the Old Testament. They disregard that command, clear commands that God's given us, and they scoff at it and make it look like it's irrelevant to the Bible, when that's not true. I believe the whole Bible harmonizes to point us to Christ. Even though the law is not something that we have to, to, to um, follow, 
in a sense, in order to get to heaven. It's, it's something that harmonizes the whole Bible for us, for it to be pointed to Jesus Christ. Now, I had you turn to 1 Peter chapter number 1. If you look down at verse 22, it says this, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. And it says this in verse 23, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So the way we're born again, the way we get saved is by God's word. You need to have God's word in order to be saved. The Bible says faith coming by hearing and hearing by the word of God. In order for someone to, to go to heaven, is you have to present them verses from the Bible. I've heard people say, well, your testimony is enough to get someone saved. Your testimony is not enough to get someone saved. You need to show them verses because if you're, if someone's trusting in your testimony saying, oh, well, I was living this rough life. You know, I was a drug dealer. I was on drugs. I was doing this. I was doing that. And uh, they're trusting that, oh, well, God's delivered me from all this stuff, and that's how I know I'm saved, which obviously is a false gospel. Yep. But let's just say someone has that testimony that their life's changed after they got saved. Well, if they're trusting that, oh, well, once I put my faith in Christ, everything in my life's just going to be great. You know, everything's going to turn around. Well, they're trusting in the wrong thing. They're, they have a wrong idea of what Christianity is, where there's going to be trials and tribulations in your life after you get saved. And actually, I would even say a lot of the time it gets harder <laughs> when after you get saved compared to prior to being saved that your life just and it's not a bad thing just that your life just gets harder or worse in the sense that you're taking a different stand or out you have a different outlook on life and therefore uh things are just not gonna always go your way or go perfectly now go with me to galatians chapter number three galatians chapter number three this is where i want to tie in the law and uh salvation to explain where the law comes from what uh application it has to salvation. Now, this isn't my sermon. This is just all introduction. I'm going to get to the sermon in a second. But uh, it's just this, I think Galatians 3 ties in the law and salvation really clearly. If you go down to, if you're in Galatians 3, look down at verse 21. It says this in Galatians 3, 21. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a life, for, sorry, if for if there had been give sorry <laughs> I'm like mixing up my words for if there had been a law given which it could have given life verily righteousness should have been by the law but the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them by that belief so it says the law isn't against the promises of God in the sense that there are blessings that come from the law you know if you do what's right God's going to bless you in this life and then even in the life to come if you don't then there's obviously curses in that but it says that in verse 22 uh, but the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ me might be given to them that believe. So the law is there. So it's, it concludes or it shows that we're all sinners. That's what the purpose of the law is and that we can get the promise of God when we put our faith in Christ. That's why it says in verse 23, but before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under the under a schoolmaster, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. So the Bible says that the law was our schoolmaster. What does that mean? The law was there to point us to Christ. It was there to show us that we're sinners, show us our need for a savior, and show us that we need to trust in Jesus Christ in order to get to heaven so that we could be justified by faith. Now turn with me to 2 Peter chapter number 1. 2 Peter chapter number 1. So I just wanted to get that out of the way just because I think that's an important aspect of God's word and how it harmonizes because you can look back at the Old Testament. Obviously there are ceremonial laws that we don't do, we don't observe at all, uh, now and then not only that there are there are just the moral aspects but all of those were there so that they could point us to christ now in second peter chapter number one look down at verse 16 it says for we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power of the coming sorry unto you the the power and coming of our lord jesus christ but were witnesses of his majesty for he received from God the Father, honor and glory, when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard 
when we were with him in the Holy Mount. So just stopping there just quickly just to kind of bring you up to speed of what's going on. If you remember back, I believe it's Matthew chapter number 17, uh, Peter, John, and James, they went up to Jesus Christ, with Jesus Christ onto the Mount of, or no, actually, yeah, yeah, on the Mount of Transfiguration, and they ended up seeing uh, Moses and Elijah. Well, then Jesus communes with Moses and Elijah, and then eventually Je uh, the Father says, they, they end up going back to heaven, and then the Father says, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So he's speaking of this event that happened, and he's just saying that we ended up, you know, as Jesus' right-hand men, we ended up seeing this, and it was something that, you know, was excellent. It's something that no man could describe. But look down at verse 19 is where I want to get at. It says this, For we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well, that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. So even though Peter has saw all these glorious things with, or he's seen all these glorious things with Jesus Christ, he says we have a more sure word, meaning that God's word, even though he saw these miracles that happened, he saw these things that we couldn't even describe, He's saying that the word of God is even more important than that, that we have a more sure word of prophecy, that those things that, especially now in the New Testament, that we have the whole word of God. So we have something that people for throughout all history didn't have and it's something that we need to appreciate. And that's why the title of the sermon today is called the great word of God, because what I want to do is just have you understand God's word and just have a different light today of how you think of God's word. It's something that we should really appreciate that we have. I mean, if it wasn't for many men to try to get the Bible compiled in the English language, we wouldn't have a good, reliable source of the Word of God. So that's what my goal is today, is just to, to kind of help you see God's Word in a, in a different light. Now go with me to Deuteronomy chapter number 8. Deuteronomy chapter number 8. Now while you're turning there, my first point is this. It's just more or less a question. Is, and the question is, is God's Word precious to you? Is God's Word something that's precious to you? And the Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter number 3, verse 1, it says, And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. So it says in the days of Samuel that God's word was precious. It was something that you, they didn't really have the full word of God. And a lot of the time they, they had to wait for God to actually speak to someone to be able to get that word, the word of God, or the word of the Lord. So it says that in those days, the word of the Lord is precious. Not only that, in Amos 8, verse 11, this is a familiar passage, but it says, Behold, the day shall come, saith the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east, they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. So the Bible saying this is that there's not there's going to be a day or there is a day where people are going to it's not just going to be a famine of bread or of water. It's actually going to be a famine of not having the word of God, not being able to hear the words of the Lord. And this is you can apply it to preaching that, you know, the, a lot of places don't have a good church where they don't get a good uh, they don't get have a place where they can hear God's word clearly <laughs> preached. But not only that, it's the same with the Bible. I mean, there are times in history where the word of God just wasn't readily available. I mean, if you think about during like the Dark Ages and the Middle Ages, they didn't have the, the Catholic Church ended up oppressing a lot of people so that they wouldn't be able to have God's word. I mean, they killed a lot of people and put them and burned them at the stake just because they didn't want to have, they didn't want people to have God's word so they can actually read the Bible on their own. And the thing with that is that, though, you know, during those days, people just, I mean, they, they had to rely on someone else. But God's made it where now we can have the Bible in our own language conveniently. Now, I had you turn to um, Deuteronomy 8. But before you turn there, just, or you're probably already there, but in, in Job 2, verse, or sorry, Job 23, 12, the Bible equates, or, yeah, the Bible equates the word of God to food a lot of the time. For instance, in Job 23, 12, it says, Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. So Job is saying that he esteemed the word of God. He esteemed God's word more than his necessary food. Now, I mean, often a lot of the time, for instance, how many times does a person eat a day? You know, 
two, three, sometimes nine. I mean, there's people on <laughs> weird diets where they eat like every two hours <laughs> or something like that. I wasn't talking about other people, but just <laughs> some people eat like every two hours just because they're on some weird fad diet. But I mean, on average, we, we say we have three square meals a day, right? Well, the thing is, is how many times are you reading your Bible? Are you reading your Bible one time a day and then think about it like this let's put it in perspective how long does it take you to sit down and eat a meal i mean a lot of times sometimes it takes people 15 minutes it takes people 20 minutes 30 minutes well how long does it take a person to read the bible i mean if you just spend 15 minutes a day reading the bible you'll get done with the bible in a year and there are probably people under the sound of my voice who have never read the bible cover to cover a day in their life but they have eaten food every day you know they have uh eaten many times a day. And we need to put priority, the Bible in its right place. We, we need to put Bible reading in its right place and make that a priority in our life. If we're gonna sit there and eat food, then every day and eat multiple times a day, you can take some time out of your day to read the Bible. Now, as you turn to Deuteronomy 8, look down at verse one, Deuteronomy 8, one, it says, all the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do that ye may live and multiply and go and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knowest not, neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out, the, out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. So we see here in Deuteronomy chapter number uh, 8, verse 2, just to quickly touch on that, that God let the children of Israel wander in the wilderness to humble them and to prove them to know that they need to rely on God and that man doesn't just live. Because if you read the New Testament, if you go into the book of John, and John 6 uh, specifically, the Jesus fed, uh, let's just say a bunch of people because I don't remember all the details, but he fed a bunch of people. And when he fed these people, they were coming back asking for that miracle, that same miracle uh, that Moses did where he let, he rain manna from heaven. Well, Jesus, this is the story of where that comes from is that God, he fed the children of Israel with manna in the wilderness, but that wasn't him doing that wasn't it was a physical thing but it wasn't the spiritual aspect was that god was trying to humble the people and then not only that he was trying to prove that man doesn't live by bread only that it's not the physical food that actually matters it's the spiritual food of the word of god and that you need to rely more or less on god's word rather than you need to just rely on food now, i'm not saying go starve yourself and then just only read your bible and not eat but what i'm saying is that there's an importance of god's word that we need to to take into account that we need to understand that reading God's word is really important in our life. It's something that should, we should take precedence over other things. I mean, a lot of the time, like I was bringing up with food, we eat multiple times a day. But I'm sure people surf YouTube or they surf the internet or they surf like different articles. And even how long does it take you to read an article? It takes you, what, five minutes, you know, depending on how long the article is. Well, why don't you use that time to actually read the Bible and put that into practice where, you know what, I'm not going to read this article. I'm actually going to sit down and take time to read the Bible. And you're going to get way more out of the Bible than you get from some news tabloid or some, you know, uh, rapper's blog or something like that. You're going to get more from what the Bible says, and it's going to be more applicable to your life. Now, go with me to Psalm, Psalms or psalm whichever way someone wants to say it but psalm 19 psalm 19 now like i said earlier many people have put their life on the line for the bible as a matter of fact william tyndale if anyone's familiar with him he wrote one of the the um he started the process of trying to translate the new testament into the english language and he had a lot of roadblocks on the during him trying to translate that and not only that he ended up being killed because the the Catholic Church didn't like what he did, so they ended up burning him at the stake. They strangled him and then burnt him at the stake, so I don't know which one killed him. Was it the strangulation or the burning? But nonetheless, his whole goal, and there's a famous quote that he says, and it says this, I, die, I defy the Pope and all his laws. If God spare my life or many years, I will cause a boy who drives the plow to know more scriptures 
to know more of the scriptures than you do. And he's pretty much defying the Pope, saying that my goal is that I want to translate the Bible. I want the Bible readily available so everyone can have it. And that some guy who's just working on a farm or some guy, some plowboy will know more than the Pope. And his goal has actually worked. I mean, we now, since we have the Bible readily available, we can... Uh, study the Bible and know more than than pastors, right. teachers, and even the Pope. I mean, the unsaved devil that he is, right. we know more than him that salvation is by faith. Yeah. So that's something that we need to just take, we can't take for granted that we have the Bible. I mean, the Bible is so convenient. For instance, I remember going to Dollar Tree and buying some Bibles. I think that was passing out to, soul, to use for soul winning. And I got to the cash register and they didn't even charge tax on the Bible. I was like, this is great. You know, like the lady who was checking out at the cash register, she was looking at it crazy too, because it came out to be like an even amount. And it was like, with tax, that wouldn't be even. So we were like, she was just like, okay, I guess that works. I mean, the Bible is so readily available. You can go to Dollar Tree and not get taxed on it. I mean, that, <laughs> I'm not saying that's applicable everywhere. I think this is back where I'm from. So then this, this, uh, this may not apply to every state and or uh, district that charges taxes by the American government or whatever. But <laughs> I mean, I went and got a, got a tax-free Bible. I mean, I think that's amazing. So it's just something that's convenient and we shouldn't take for granted that we have the Bible. Now, my second point is this, is that, is, is this, it's just another question, is this, that is God's word perfect to you? You know, do you see God's word as perfect? Do you think that or believe that God's word is perfect? Not that when you end up getting, you're reading your Bible and then you come to two things that don't like make sense to you. Are you just automatically the type of person that says this is a contradiction? Or are you the type of person that says, you know what, I probably need to study this out more to understand where this is coming from, why this may not make sense in my head, because I believe God's word is perfect. Because if someone has that attitude that you say, hey, God's word is perfect, so anytime there is something that may look like a contradiction or something that doesn't make sense to me, then I'm just going to say it's probably something wrong with me rather than wrong with the Bible. I remember just reading the Bible early on in my Christian life, when, you know, after I got saved, and there are a lot of things I didn't understand. And the thing is, the more you read, the more you're going to understand. I mean, I look back, I remember, because I'm like, I'm a nerd, let's just put it like that. So <laughs> I remember whenever I read things to understand, I'll take notes, a lot of notes about it. So I was like, I remember reading the Bible cover to cover the first time, and I'm like taking notes. And I remember one of the notes I made in like this notebook I was, I was writing, I was like, who is Molech? Because at the time, I didn't know who Molech was. I was just like, I know this guy is bad, but I'm going to figure out who this Molech guy is eventually. So, I mean, I, after reading the Bible cover to cover, I figured out Molech was a bad guy. <laughs> I mean, I figured out who he was. And that's how it is. I mean, yeah, it may sound stupid to a certain extent, but that's how it is when you first get saved, when you first get into the Bible, you're not going to just know everything that's in there. And obviously, like with preaching, it's a supplement. Preaching's there for you to understand the Bible better, but preaching, you're not always going to get preached everything. You know, everything you read may not always be preached, or may not, there may not be the time where that's preached. Like, for instance, um, like, I don't know if anyone's preached through, like, Deuteronomy yet. I think this church is, right? Brother Corbin's preaching yeah. De through Deuteronomy, but I, I haven't seen too many people preach through, through Deuteronomy. And Deuteronomy, I think, is all, t in my opinion, it's one of like God's or the best books of the Bible. It's just because it's action packed. There's a lot of just things that are going on, and it teaches you God's mind and stuff like that. So the reason I'm bringing that up is just that a person, you have to have that idea just in it when you walk into reading the Bible that God's word is perfect. If you already have that idea, it's going to make your Bible reading a lot easier and that you're not going to have like too many downfalls when it comes to reading it where you just kind of give up. Now, I had you turn to Psalm uh, 19. Look down at verse 7 where the Bible reads and says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. So God's law is perfect, and why is it perfect? Well, it converts the soul. We saw earlier in Galatians that with God's word, the law is there to bring us on to Christ. So this, uh, even though it's in the Old Testament, you can tie that into that, is that God's law is perfect, and it's going to convert your soul, whether you could say physically or spiritually in the sense that you get saved off of God's law, in the sense that you have to understand that you're a sinner, or it's going to change your life. It's going to change who you are. It says, the testimony of the Lord is, sh Lord is sure, making wise the simple. And I can say this, you know, like I was saying earlier, when I first started reading the Bible, there's a lot of things I didn't understand. But the more I read it, the 
less simple I became. You know, I started gaining more knowledge. I started getting, gaining more understanding of the Bible. And that's the, and I, I've noticed that it, that's even helped other aspects of my life. Because I wasn't someone, there was a point in time where I loved to read. And then after that, I just hated to read. But then after reading the Bible, I got back into the phase where I like reading again. I think reading is important. I think that's even a lot of the time, sometimes the best way of learning is by reading. So the Bible's there to make you wise, not just in spiritual matters, but it's also there to make you wise in just other aspects of your life. The Bo- it says in verse 8, The statutes of, of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. So it's saying that God's judgments are true. Anyone who reads God's word and reads what the Bible says about God judging different nations or how he judges people in general or if so anyone who goes to hell, they're going to say, yeah, everything that God does is righteous. And why, how do they get that? It's by reading God's word, by understanding his law. It says more to be desired are they than gold. Yea, the much fine gold, sweet, sweeter also than the honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. And like I said earlier, if someone reads the Bible, if someone understands what's right and what's wrong in God's sight, there's going to be blessings uh, uh, in that person's life when they're doing what's right. And it's just simply by reading the Bible. Now, <coughs> I'm going to have you turn to Ephesians chapter number 4. And while you're turning to Ephesians chapter number four, I just want to bring up how God's law is perfect. I think that God's law is, is something that someone can look at or, or understand that no other like religious text, we'll just use that because I don't believe any of, because people call like the Quran or whatever other books, holy books, because they're not holy, they're yeah, wicked right. books. But these other religious texts, they're, they don't hold any candle or a candle to what the Bible says about just different things that are right and wrong. For instance, I was doing some research. And I, was, I was looking in the Quran, which, by the way, the Quran, I know pastors said this before, Pastor Anderson. He said that it's a stupid book, and I agree, because I tried to just look at some verses in the Quran just to kind of, like, bring things up, and it's just literally all over the place. It's like you'll start looking at one point. Like, I, I was looking at, like, the back of a Quran where it has, like, all the the notes of where things are at. So I was just like, oh, it talks about Jonah. So I wanted to see what they, you know, the Quran said about Jonah. And it literally is like all over the place. Like, I don't know if they call them verses. I know their books are called surahs, but like, I don't know if they're, they're verses, like, because they, they have it labeled like surah, let's just say surah one, two. So maybe it's a verse, maybe they call it a verse. But anyway, I look at the stuff with Juna, uh, Jonah and it's just literally all over the place. It's like one verse in this, this book of, this surah talks about Jonah and then it starts talking about all these other random things. And then you go to another point where it kind of like actually gives the story of Jonah, but it's not like really clear. And then it jumps to all this other stuff. So it's a really weird book. I don't see how these Muslims just love it (laughs) because it's not a book that I think anyone would want to read. It's just that dumb. But in the Quran, in Surah 5, it says this. It says that theft is punishable by the amputation of hands. So probably many of you have heard that before in other countries that whenever someone steals something, that they end up cutting off the person's hands. Well, I think that is dumb. <laughs> I think that's in, uh, it's, it's, it, it's just dumb. because. And I'm going to show you from the Bible why I think that's dumb. But now I'm just going to read from what the Quran says. It says, As for the thief, the male and female amputate their hands in recompense for what they committed as a deterrent, and it puts in uh, brackets, punishment from Allah. And Allah is exalted in might and wise. So it's saying that cut off someone's hand as a deterrent, obviously for other people that they won't steal from from others. Well, if we know what the Bible says about theft, I mean, I'll just read out some verses from Exodus, but it says in Exodus 22, verse 1, it says, If a man steal a sh- uh, an ox or a sheep and kill it or sell it, he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. And then it says, If a thief be found breaking, breaking up, and be smitten that he die, there shall no blood be shed for him. If the sun be risen upon him, there shall blood be shed for him. For he should make full restitution. If he have nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. And then I'll just read one last verse. It says, if the theft can, if the theft be certainly found 
in his hand alive, whether it be ox or ass or sheep, he shall restore double. So just breaking all these things down for you is this, is that if someone steals an ox or a sheep and he ends up killing it or selling it, so it's not in his possession, then he has to re restore, uh, for an oxen, you have to restore fivefold, and then for a sheep, you have to restore fourfold. So it just depends on the value of the item. Not only that, it says that if you find a thief breaking into your house at night, then you have all right to kill him because you don't know what they're going to do. I mean, I've watched this thing on YouTube. Uh, many, maybe some of you guys, it's like active self-protection. I don't know if some of you guys watched that before. <laughs> I've watched it. Uh, I watch it often, but there's a lot of important things on that. I don't know if the guy is saved or not, but whatever. But it tells you a lot of things about just protecting your household. And I mean, seeing some of those videos, it kind of just gives you a different light on, you know, when and when not to kill someone. <laughs> you know, if they're, you have what, what is it called? Their uh, space, what's the thing? Your transitional spaces and all that other stuff. Any guy who watches it knows what I'm talking about. But, <laughs> but the point I'm getting at with that is, yeah, I mean, if someone breaks in your house, a lot of the time they're armed and you have all right if you know that they're a threat to kill them. And that's what the Bible say. But if it's in the daytime, then you can actually see, you know, if they actually have a weapon on them or something like that. And therefore, you can't kill them, obviously, unless your life's in danger. And then it says this in verse 4, if, if the theft be certainly found in his hand alive, whether it be ox or ass or sheep, he shall restore double. So if someone takes an ox from someone and then they find it uh, alive with him, you know, they find the property, then... He's got to restore double on that. So those make sense. I mean, you don't, you're not cutting anyone's hands off. You're not, uh, if it's just pretty much if someone steals from you, if they're not doing it at night where you feel like your life's threatened, then uh, the person doesn't get killed. I mean, they just, you, they have to restore what they stole. And if they didn't, uh, if they don't restore what was what they stole from you, then they become a servant until they pay whatever off, right. wherever the property is. So I had you turn to Ephesians for, because look at this, and this just contradicts the, what the Bible says, for, or the Quran, it contradicts what the Bible says. Because a lot of the Quran, they like to mix in things with Christianity in it for some weird reason. But it says this in Ephesians 4.28, Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good that he may have to him, sorry, that may, he may have to give him that needeth. So it's saying that if someone steals, what, what do you do? You just let him steal no more. But what does he do? He labors. And what does it say? Working with his hands. So if a person's going to steal, the goal is that, hey, yeah, they can reform. They can they steal no more. And then what do they do? They become a worker. They work with their hands. Well, if you cut off their hands, they can't work anymore. So it's just like that makes that that, that contradicts what the Bible says. That's why I'm saying is that God's law makes way more sense than right. these other laws, these other re religious texts. Now, another thing that I read in the Quran was about divorce. And this is from Surah 229. It says this. This is the first three words. Divorce is twice. I mean, that's already a problem. Divorce is twice. If we just read that with face value, it's at least saying you can get divorced twice. And it says, the, then either keep her or in an acceptable manner or release her with good treatment. I'm not going to read the rest of it just for, because it's just that stupid. But go with me to Matthew chapter 19, Matthew 19. So the Quran is saying divorce is twice. You should get divorced twice, <laughs> at least. And then it says, like, if you get divorced from a woman, then um, she has to wait 90 days for her to go through her cycles or something like that. That's the Quran's weird idea of divorce and then a lot of these people who are muslims they like to sit there and say well we're more holier than christians well you're promoting divorce and you're sitting there incorporating jesus in your text and let's see what jesus actually says about divorce in matthew 19 9, uh, 19, 9 the bible reason says and i say unto you whosoever shall put away his wife except it be for fornication and marry another committeth adultery and whosoever marrieth her that is which is put away doth commit adultery. Jesus Christ says this, and it's nice and simple, that if you marry, if you, uh, marry someone who's put away, then you're committing adultery. Or if you put away your wife to marry another, you're committing adultery. Regardless, however you want to slice and dice it, divorce and remarriage is wrong anyway. It's not twice. It's not even once. You can't get divorced at all. Once you get married, it's still death to you part. And the, the Quran is just sitting there. Um, it's pretty much just not, it, it's, it's, how should I put it? It's, 
making the the institution of marriage of none effect. It's yeah. making that those vows that you make that you're going to be with your spouse for for till death do you part of just none effect because it's saying yeah you can get a divorce. As a matter of fact, do it twice yes. and then we can go from there. Now, <coughs> not only that, <coughs> I want you to go to Second Corinthians chapter number two. Second Corinthians chapter number two. Now. My second sub point is this, is that do you defend the King James Bible? That's another thing about God's word being perfect. Because a lot of people, they'll give it lip service. They'll come to a church like this and say, oh, yeah, I like the King James Bible. But, you know, they have an NIV under their pillow to help them sleep at night. Or they use an NIV or they give people like an NIV calendar or something. We should not, we should hate these false Bible versions because they corrupt the word of God. They change God's word. And it's something that we shouldn't condone. Because what they're saying, when you have these false Bible versions, you're, you're, you're ultimately saying is that, what you're ultimately saying is that God's word isn't perfect. That's why you have all these different, different versions out there. We believe God's word is perfect, and we believe that the King James Bible is perfect, that it's without error, that anyone can read the King James Bible, understand it, and they can uh, apply the things that are found in the King James Bible to their lives and teach it for doctrine. Now, I had you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter number 2, because I want to show you a contradiction that's found inside of the new Bible versions compared to the King James. And in 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 2 verse 15, I may have said the wrong thing, but 2 Corinthians 2 15, the Bible reads and it says, For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. To, to the one we are savor of death unto death and to the other the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God in the sight of God speak we in Christ. So what it's saying here is that God's word is uh, that God, the sweet savor is Christ. And when we preach God's word, it's it can be a death to some people that that savor could be a death because they are not saved. And, you know, God's going to judge them and ultimately they would go to hell or it could be a savor onto life where they put their faith in Christ and they end up getting to heaven. But it says in verse 17, for we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. So it's saying that, thank you. <coughs> it's saying that, we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. So these new modern Bible versions, they end up corrupting God's word. And as a matter of fact, they end up changing this where it says we are not as, ah, sorry, we are not, I'm reading like two different ones because I'm reading one of the false ones and then I'm trying to <laughs> read the King James. It says, for, for we are not as, for we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. So for instance, I'll just jump to it in the ESV it says for we we are not like so many peddlers of the word of God so in the the ESV it changes corrupt to peddler and the word corrupt and pedal are not the same thing and it's not bike pedaling either and so I'm talking about actual pedaling where it means that something is being sold something that and just the definition of pedal from di dictionary.com just to give you that it says there are many different definitions, but it says to carry uh, small articles, goods, wares from one place, from place to place for sale at retail. And then it says to deal out, to deal out, distribute or dispense, especially in small quantities, to peddle radical ideas. It says to sell drugs illicitly. And then it says this to go from place to place with goods for sale at retail. So the primary definition of peddle is that you're going around selling things and then there's another s minor definition that just says that you're you're peddling meaning that you're bringing out different ideas but that's still not the same thing as corrupt corrupt means and I'm, i have the diff th the definition of corrupt where it says to destroy the integrity of cause to be dishonest disloyal especially by bribery it says to lower morally pervert to corrupt youth. It says to alter, and it says in parentheses, a language, text, or etc. for the worst, debase. And then it says to become corrupt. So one of the important, I believe the main definitions whenever we think of corrupt is something that's altered to become worse. Well, I think the King James Bible is using the right terminology where it says, for we are not as many 
at, which corrupt the word of God, meaning that we're not people that go out and change the language of God. We change God's words to fit whatever idea is. And as a matter of fact, when these people are talking about pedal, they're not talking about that minor definition I told you where it says, um, I got to find it. <laughs> The definition where it says pretty much to peddle radical ideas. They're talking about the definition of to sell. For the for instance, in the NIV, it says, unlike so many, in the same in verse 17, if you look at it in the King James, it says, unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. So they're talking about selling God's word. They're not talking about actually changing people's ideas right. that we're not out here to change the word of God to change ideas no they're saying that we're not here to sell the word of God nothing's wrong with selling a Bible because if you really want to just break it down nothing's wrong with someone selling a Bible yeah, right. I mean we go to stores to buy Bibles like I was telling you earlier at Dollar Tree they didn't even charge me tax for buying a Bible nothing's wrong with someone selling a Bible at all What's wrong is when someone corrupts God's word. What's wrong is when someone changes God's word to fit some weird agenda. And even the New King James does this. It says, for we are not as many peddling the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. So even the New King James says that, oh, we're not people who peddle God's word. We're not people who sell God's word. And then I looked this up in the Amplified Bible. I don't know if anyone's familiar with the Amplified Bible. I've heard of that. So the Amplified Bible does this. It like, it, it does what it says. It amplifies <laughs> what things are said in the Bible. The way I found out this Bible even exists is with uh, Creflo Dollar, if anyone's familiar with him, the false prophet that he is. But, uh, he would use all these different Bible versions, and he used the Amplified Bible. So it's just like, say, uh, let's just use John 3.16, uh, 3 for instance. I'm just going to give you an example. I don't know if this is what it says, but it's like, for God to love the world. This means the whole world, not just this person or that person. That's kind of like how the Amplified Bi Bible does it. And then it's like he, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever. It's like whosoever means this. It means anyone. So it just like inserts all these things for you to, to amplify what the Bible says. So I have the, ampl like in the Amplified Bible, it says this. For we are not like many acting like merchants, peddling the word of God, shortchanging and adulterating God's message, but for a pure, uncompromised motive as commissioned and sent from God, we speak his message in Christ in the sight of God. So it's saying it's adding all these extra words in saying that we're not people who sell God's word. We're not shortchanging you. We're not adulterating. We're just <laughs> <it's> like <laughs> Sounds like, I don't know if anyone knows Ice-T, the, yeah. the old rapper. That's what I think about when I hear this. It's like, <laughs> And then on top of that, there's another one. There's an Amplified Classic. So this is like the triple OG of old Bible ver or Bible versions or false Bible versions of the Amplified Bible where it says, For we are not like so many like hucksters making a trade, peddling God's word, short changing and adulterating the divine message so to me <laughs> it sounds like these people are trying to like like you know like they're they're making the bible like a drug deal or something <laughs> it's like i think it's some guy he, he has his pants pulled down he's just walking he's like hey man i got this bible for you i got it for the low and then he sees a police officer he like starts running all his bibles like fall out of his pocket <laughs> and then the <laughs> the police is like, yep, we got another. We got another one of those, those bobble dealers out here. <laughs> that's what I see when I think of this, this garbage. So that's why we shouldn't use these stupid bobble versions. They obviously change God's word for the worse, not for the better. And you shouldn't get caught up, even if your family uses it. Don't get caught up in that the, the garbage of, oh, it just makes it easier to read. It doesn't make it easier to read. It confuses things. It changes doctrine. I mean, for someone to have the audacity to take out God's name, in many different places or take out verses from the Bible, you know that the, there, it's a wicked person, it's a wicked agenda. So we shouldn't support those things. We should know that the King James is perfect and we should appreciate the King James for it being perfect and for it being the best Bible that we can use in the English language. Now my last point is this, and it's gonna be a shorter point, but go with me to 1 Thessalonians 2, 1 Thessalonians 2. And it says in uh, Romans 8, 28, or my last point is just this, is that, that does God's word change you? And that's what I want to bring out. You know, it's just it, God's word, yeah, it obviously saves us and it gives us faith, but does it change us is my question. When you read God's word, 
Does your life change because you read it? Is it something that you look into or you read more and that you can see your life changing by reading it? The Bible says in Romans 8, 29, it says, For whom he did know, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So God's goal is that after we get saved, that we're going to be conformed to the image of the son, being, meaning that we're going to be more like Christ. You know, the Bible talks about when Christ was reviled, he reviled not, he, uh, he reviled not back pretty much, where if when, when Christ, when people are bad mouthing Christ, he, know, he knew the time to snap back at him, but he knew times where, hey, it's not even necessary. You know, has, has reading the Bible changed you where you know, hey, this is the time to snap at some false prophet or some guy at the job, you know, he's treating you like trash. You know, am I supposed to just jump on his back whenever he does something wrong? You know, the Bible teaches us things like that right. or when he says something that you don't like. You know, the Bible teaches us that, you know, when to do things, when to, when to not, and to make us more like Christ. The Bible says in Hebrews 4.12, it says, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and, is, and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and, the in, and intents of the heart. So the Bible said God's word is quick, quick and powerful and it equates it to a sword. It says God's word is like a sword and it's able to tell us what we actually, it's, it's able to, to, to see through our hearts and see who we really are. And I remember just reading the Bible cover to cover early on in my Christian life or after I got saved. And I just remember things that I saw from the Bible that I'm just like, well, maybe this is wrong, so I shouldn't be doing it. It's not even like just preaching was the only thing that helped, helped me clean up my life. It's just actually sitting down and reading God's word and getting closer to God and understanding what God requires out of me. Now, as you turn to 1 Thessalonians 2, it says this in verse 13, For this cause also we thank God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as of the word of men, not as the word of men, but as it is in, the tr in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. So is God's word effectually working in you, you know, as a believer, as a saved person? Do you read God's word and it's actually changing your life for the better? Is it inspiring you when you read uh, times about Jesus weeping over cities? and um, just different, uh, over different cities or Jesus weeping over uh, lost souls, does that inspire you to go out and go soul winning? Does that inspire you to do more for God? And that's the question I have for you today, is that is, that, is God's word changing you when you read it? Now, like I said, the whole premise or the, the, the importance of the sermon is this, is that I want to glorify God's word. And I'm hoping that just helped you, kind of motivated you more or less to read your Bible more, because that's the whole premise of the sermon, is just that we have this new year approaching, and I'm sure people may have had goals in, in this year, in 2019, to say, oh, well, I want to read my Bible cover to cover once at least. And they may have failed at that goal. Well, you have a new year coming, and you can accomplish that goal of reading God's word. And God's word is interesting. I mean, the many times that I've read it cover to cover, I love it. I think it's just, it's amazing. And yeah, there's some times that it's harder to read than others. But when you just like sit down and take some time to read, out the, bo read the Bible, you're just like, man, this is a really great book. Just like I was telling you with the Quran, it's just literally all over the place. The Bible's not like that. You can read it and it's just, everything's clear in the sense of how it's, 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 it's uh, structured, how it's written. You can see where it's pointing to and things like that. So it's something that that especially that we have the word of god that we shouldn't take for granted so i'm just gonna give a few quick tips on and this will be really short on how you can get your bible reading done or accomplish your goals accomplished for for the next year you know if you failed this year don't worry as long as you don't die before uh what's that called december 31st then you got another year buddy <laughs> you got another chance to read your bible next year but um one thing is just set a goal, you know, and figure out how long that goal will take to accomplish. So say if you have that goal of just reading your Bible once a year, well, the saying is you read 15 minutes a day, then you have you can have the whole Bible read in a year. So why don't you take figure out when you can take that 15 minutes a day to read it? Now, I'm someone who's an early bird, so I think reading the Bible and this is my personal opinion. Maybe some some of you guys are night owls, but reading the Bible early in the morning is 10 times easier for me to read at night because I'm so tired after I get off work and I've done I've done everything for the day. By the time I start reading, I'll get like 10 verses in and I'm yeah. asleep and the next thing I know, I wake up in the morning. I'm like, oh no. So it's just one of those things where 
you need to figure out a time that you're alert to read the Bible and that you can take the time to read the Bible. A lot of guys, you know, for instance, they'll have their lunch break and they'll read their Bible on the lunch, bu- lunch break. And I think that's a good point in time to read your Bible where you don't have to just sit there and surf on Facebook to see what's going on there. You can take that time to read your Bible and, and get more from God's Word. Because I remember a pastor saying this. This is a sermon I heard years ago. And someone asked him this. I don't know why they even asked him this question, but I think it's a good sermon illustration. But he said this. He said, Um, which one would you rather have? Would you rather be able to pray to God or would you rather be able to read the Bible? And you know what the pastor said? He said, I would rather be able to to read the Bible. Why is that? You know, the guy asked, why is that? Well, he said, because when I'm praying to God, I'm just telling him all my problems. I'm asking for stuff. I'm telling him my problems. But he said, if I actually want to hear from God, then I have to read the Bible. And God doesn't speak to us in some audible voice where he's like, Caleb, drink that water because you've been (laughs) trying to avoid drinking it for like a few minutes because you're trying to get through with your sermon, but you're not. So you might as well just drink it now. God didn't tell me to drink this water. I'm drinking it on my own. But what I'm saying is this. God doesn't tell me that audibly. He doesn't tell me things audibly. The way I understand what God wants out of me is by reading his word. And that's the way you're going to hear from God. It's not that God's going to just talk to you out of the sky. God's going to, the way you're going to hear from God is when you take time to read his word. And that's, it's going to speak to your heart and it's going to help change your life. And then try to get a Bible reading streak going on. That's another tip I can give. You know, a lot of people, they'll have uh, their Duolingo streaks going on. So like my wife, she had like a 300 and something day or 400 and something day Duolingo streak. And then something happened and she lost it all. So... (laughs) Think about that, like Bible reading. If you have like a 400-day streak reading the Bible, that's definitely more than once a year if you just even have that goal of reading it once a year. So maybe if you, you're someone who's motivated by having streaks, then take the time to have streaks of reading the Bible, and that may be able to help you get it done. But And then for people who have already read the Bible cover to cover, those, you know, those veteran people that have read it, then you can take some more time to read it more. If that's your goal, if you're someone who only reads it twice a year, maybe this next year you can make it three times a year. Or you could up the ante and read it four. And even if you fail at the goal, let's just say you you end up failing, well, at least you tried. And you probably are going to do more then then you know say if you've only read it you you only read it twice on a normal basis a year and then you try to read four well you maybe get you maybe you'll get the bible done in three months and you know at least you have that under your belt that hey i've read the bible cover to cover in three months so it's just stuff to take into account and stuff to think about but let this new year be a time and you can start now i'm not saying just wait the next like two weeks before you read your bible you know read it now but if you want to have a goal to, to read the Bible cover to cover, then you have next year to start it, and you have a whole year to get it done. So let's pray.